great to see so many of you here. Um, the aim of this session this morning is really to talk to you in very practical and focused ways about uh, the things that actually make a difference in Cambridge admission. And uh, I'm, I'm, I think, well placed to uh, advise you on those things. I've been a university admissions tutor for, um, uh, gosh, a very long time now, since the year 2000. Uh, and I'm senior tutor here in Churchill, so I'm responsible for all of the students, uh, their education, uh, their wider welfare, uh, and of course, uh, selection, very ably assisted by our admissions tutors, Nick, Sally, and Paul, who are with us and will be uh, chipping in a little later. Um, and as I say, what we really want to do is focus upon the things that will make a difference to your prospects of getting in to Cambridge. Now, you're here in Churchill, um, and uh, you may be thinking, what we hear here this morning is really primarily about Churchill, not about the wider university. There are going to be variations, naturally, uh, among the approaches of the colleges. But actually, what, what you see here is very much representative of the pattern elsewhere. There is a single Cambridge admissions process into which all of the colleges buy. Um, there are very slight variations in focus, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that as we go. Uh, but you know, the, the central uh, fundamentals are the same. And actually, your experience of being in this college today, and what you will see, what you will hear, is uh, representative of the wider university too and other colleges. There will be people here who are part of uh, school groups who are probably not thinking about applying to Churchill. You may already be thinking about applying to other colleges. I strongly advise you against that, but you might be thinking about it. Um, and uh, what you will see here is, is representative of what you see there. You're here as part of a school group. It makes sense to have people all in a group together. And realistically, we know, joking all apart, that um, even if all of you here decide to apply to Cambridge uh, at the end of uh, the summer, and some of you almost certainly won't, um, you won't all be applying here. It'd be great if you did, but you won't be. And so we're reflecting the wider university in what we say. I wanted to start off before we talk about how the admissions process works and how you get in by talking to you about the fundamentals of Cambridge, why you should think about it. Because in a sense, understanding what you need to do is fundamentally about understanding the way the university works and the way that we see the world. And quite a lot of that is at odds with popular conceptions of what the university is about and what we're looking for. So what you're going to get this morning is a, a pretty much unvarnished truth. If you're thinking about what distinguishes Cambridge, the obvious thing that's different in this university compared with most other universities, the obvious exception to that general rule being Oxford, which is very similar to Cambridge, is that we are collegiate. The university is made up of 31 colleges, 29 of which take undergraduates, um, and uh, it would be intuitive to suppose that there are going to be significant differences between them. In fact, um, there aren't. Um, so there are differences that we might consider to be, I suppose, superficial. You're here in this fabulous theatre slash cinema here in Churchill. Um, I, not every college has a facility like this. Not every college has... Uh, in fact, no college has such big grounds as we have. Not every college has the music practice facilities, the art studio the central and open bar that we have. But all colleges will have their own facilities, and there, are, uh, there is a core of things that all the colleges um, have, uh, it, you know, irrespective of, of other factors. They all have students' unions. They all have sports teams. They will all have some college music. They will all have uh, a student bar. In some cases, it's a concrete bunker buried deep in the ground um, so that um, students can do um, student things without disturbing anyone. Um, here, we like to get involved in the disturbance ourselves as a wider college community. That's why our bar is open to everyone. Um, so there are, there are universals. There are differences. The differences don't matter that much, in fact. So far as admissions goes, it, you know, the differences are extremely minor. But what the existence of colleges does do, rather than providing a very different experience for different people in different colleges, is provide a common resource that other universities don't have. This is the critical thing. So if we think about what you get for your £9,000 tuition fee, if, if you're a UK EU student, um, you get um, all of the things that other universities provide, the competitive universities, lectures, seminars, uh, and the like, but you get something on top which is crucial, and that's supervision. Uh, the very small group, often one-to-one, -one, individualised teaching that every Cambridge student receives every week in every course component that they're taking from the very beginning of their course. So I'm a historian, lecturer in the history faculty. I see my historians a couple of times a week in lectures. 
Uh, that's the historians across the university in a group maybe not usually as big as this, maybe half the size of this. And then many of those students I will see individually every week as well in my office here in Churchill College. There'll be set work individually by me with a reading list tailored to their particular interests uh, and uh, the things that they're thinking about doing in the exam. Uh, they'll write an essay, about 3,000 words in the case of history, hand it in on a Tuesday night usually. I mark it overnight, see them on Wednesday. We talk individually about their work. So this is a process, there are parallel processes in every subject which bring the students on incredibly quickly and make learning for them and for us, teaching, incredibly rewarding. But it's very expensive. So if you're £9,000, you get teaching that costs the university an additional £9,000, £18,000 in total. Uh, you're looking at us and thinking, what do I get for my 9000 quid? We're looking at you and thinking, what do we get for our 9000 quid? because we're putting equal amounts of money into the pot of your education. And that money, from the university end, comes from the colleges, which are individual, private foundations, charities, with education at their heart. So that's, that's really the key thing. The big difference here is the teaching. And the cost of the teaching is borne by the colleges. The other things that you might think are critical about colleges are actually much less important. It's the teaching that matters. Teaching around courses that are cutting edge, innovative. This university is one of the world's great research universities. Uh, we can quantify that, the QS World Rankings, the most widely used uh, ranking uh, table of world universities, almost always has Cambridge uh, in either first or second position in the world. Um, the UK does very well in those rankings, actually. In the last set of rankings, uh, four of the top ten places were occupied by UK universities, which is pretty remarkable under the circumstances. And actually, if you look at the top 250 universities in the world, um, all of the top group of research universities in the UK are among that top 250. So research here is really, really good. But Cambridge stands out. And it translates into courses that are, for you, very much focused upon uh, the core that you need to know, but then the margins of your subject where it gets really exciting. What that means for you as learners is that... You will find yourself, as I say, learning a, a technical core. You will be learning some things that you have to learn, some in inverted commas right answers, but you'll spend much of your time, and as you get further through your course, most of your time, in fact, uh, working on things that actually no one is really sure about. Uh, and in some cases, nobody knows about it at all. You end up doing a project in your third year, your fourth year, maybe as a scientist, uh, or a dissertation in the arts and humanities in your third year, you are likely to end up as the world expert on the particular thing that you're researching and writing on. And you might think that sounds ridiculous, but that's what will happen. Now, that could happen at other universities too, but preeminently it happens here. It's one of the really exciting things for us. How is our, uh, our own teaching refreshed? Why is it always thinking about new paths. It's partly because of the work that we do ourselves, but it's very substantially because of the work that you do as our colleagues. You're not just students, you're colleagues. Uh, you work with us, you help us push back the boundaries, and it's what makes it so exciting. But it also means that we're looking for uh, real and fundamental commitment to the subject, which we'll come back to uh, later. Uh, and it also means that you need to be somebody who um, understands that your time has to be well invested. Again, we'll, we'll reflect on that in a minute, but it's, it's very exciting. Um, it also is reflected in the admissions process in that you, you know, you're at school or college, you're being, I'm sure in the vast majority of cases, extremely well taught by very dedicated teachers and lecturers. Um, you're operating within school syllabuses, which have at their core quite a lot of right answers that you learn. So other people tell you what the answer is, you learn the answer, your job is to uh, internalize it, and at some point regurgitate it, use it, but regurgitate it. Here, it's much more about questions, and uh, the syllabus is a much more a series of, of open-ended questions. So we're looking for people who are already questioning rather than wanting to receive the right answer. In other words, we're looking for people who have that capacity independently to learn. Uh, very, very important. You can't do this research. You can't deliver great teaching without superb facilities. Um, and uh, the lab facilities, the library facilities, extraordinary library facilities, in fact, superb IT, these will underpin your learning right across this university in a diverse community. Now, Oxford and Cambridge have had in the past, to some degree still do have, 
uh, reputations for being uh, socially elite. Um, they're academically elite. Um, they are much less socially elite than you might suppose. So the majority of students, large majority of students here in this university uh, from the UK are from state schools. Uh, there are many students from very, very uh, poor backgrounds in financial terms. Um, and there are many students here who are first generation university. I'm first generation university from an ordinary background. Most of my colleagues are too. You know, so this is something that, that we all understand very well. But you'll come here and be part of not just a community in the UK that is broad in terms of its, of its social makeup, but an international community. We have very many European and uh, extra European students in Cambridge. This college, Churchill, is a bit more international than most. About 25% of our undergraduates come from outside the UK, and about 70% of our graduate students who have a very large graduate community here. And that richness of community is part of the joy of being at university and part of the experience that you will have. And uh, it's one of the things that gives me, as senior tutor here, greatest pleasure is seeing people from very, very different backgrounds teaming up and becoming best friends. And you know that those friendships are going to endure in the vast majority of cases for many, many years, if not for life. Uh, and it's enriching for everyone. So the diversity of, 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 of what happens here around academic endeavour uh, is, I think, another reward in itself. It's also cheap. <coughs> Cambridge University among the Russell Group of, intense, of research-intensive universities in the UK, is the cheapest at which to live. Uh, accommodation costs are very, very competitive. Um, we are able to provide uh, really good value in terms of food, other practical things. There are virtually no transport costs in Cambridge, uh, other than shoe leather and bike tyres. Um, you, you won't have to buy books. And we have very, very good financial support, particularly for UK and EU students through the Cambridge Bursary Scheme and the Cambridge European Bursaries. And here in Churchill, we also have uh, a significant tranche of additional financial support provided by the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, uh, BG Group, and others. So nobody leaves for financial reasons, uh, and they never have. Uh, this is a, a very, very affordable option. And if you are worried about the costs of going to university, well, this is not a university uh, at which... Um, those costs are likely to be an impediment to your progress. They won't be. Um, and remember that for every pound you spend, you get two pounds worth back. And that as far as maintenance is concerned, because you will rent your room from college for either all or the vast bulk of your undergraduate career, um, you will, in a sense, also be paying for tuition in the rent that you pay. In other words, you know, what could be going to a private landlord is actually just being reinvested in your education. So it's a very, very good financial story. Career opportunities exist in every subject. And this is something, particularly those of you from outside the UK, um, I think are surprised by. The UK employment market at the highest level, if we're talking about top flight graduate employment, um, is much less interested in which subject you studied than in how well you did at which university. So if you want to maximise your career opportunities in this country, you study a subject at university that you are really committed to and interested in, which you will enjoy. All of those things apply. You will understand it better. You will work harder. You will find the outer reaches of it in a way that won't be possible in something that you're not connected to fundamentally. So you have to focus upon the inner relationship with the subject, and you'll hear much more about that this morning. Um, if I think about Students graduating from this college, they go on and do a huge range of things. Many of them receive very high starting salaries, but it's absolutely not the case that the people with the best economic opportunities or the best career choices are the ones in jobs that are, um, sorry, the ones in subjects that are most obviously related to the world of commerce or business. Um, the archaeologists, the historians, the musicians, the chemists, the biologists, all of these people will go on and work in the City of London if they wish to alongside the economists and the mathematicians. You know, that just happens all the time. And, of course, many people will choose not to do those things. They'll choose to go off and do other things. Um, and uh, that includes many of the people who've done degrees in economics or mathematics. So it, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is how well you do. I could take you down to the Cambridge University Career Service. I could show you all of the graduate jobs down there that are advertised. There are about 200 vacancies advertised for every graduating student at this <laughs> university down uh, there in the career service. 
95% um, of those jobs do not specify a degree subject. But the vast majority say you have to have a 2-1 or a 1st, a good degree. So choosing the right subject in which you're likeliest to get a good degree is fundamental. Oh, I've pressed the wrong button. There we are. So what characteristics do we look for in students? It reflects what I've said already about the nature of the university. In the end, we're looking for people who are very, very interested in their subject. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going around shouting about it. It could be a slow-burning, deep interest. You, know, you could be a quiet person. Um, and you might think that within the admissions process, we're looking for people who are selling themselves in relation to their subject. You will sell yourself if you're genuinely interested, because it will just be there and it will be real. Again, we'll explain as we go. So the right subject for you, and also the right fit between your particular interests and aptitudes and the course that we offer. Let's take the example of economics. Uh, Cambridge Economics, superb course, very competitive for entry, um, very much enjoyed by the students uh, that are on it, uh, but highly mathematical. So there will be people, there are probably people in this audience who are very interested potentially in economics, but maybe who aren't natural mathematicians at the very highest level in the way that they really need to be to do well on our particular sort of economics course. An alternative, which is less mathematical, would be PPE, Politics, Philosophy and Economics at Oxford. You might be somebody who is debating, is it Cambridge Economics, is it PPE? So you think about your mathematical ability as you think about the content of the course as part of making the right decision for you. And for all of you, thinking about what our course requires, develops, rewards is important, as well as thinking about which subject. We need you to do well in exams. Why? Because in the end, what we're looking for here is students who will do very well with us. And the only really reliable yardstick of that is how well you do in university exams, which really matter to us. Um, they are the sign that you are doing well. They are the sign that we are doing well. Uh, and in Cambridge, you do exams at the end of every year. So we're looking for people who are good at exams, who can deliver in exams. It's not the only thing that we're looking for, but it's pretty much got to be there. And we'll show you in a minute how important examination results are in your chances of being admitted. And then we're into the, the qualities, the characteristics of the individual that are perhaps a bit less obvious. Natural curiosity. We like people who are just interested in stuff. Uh, the people who will go the extra mile to find out more, not because they've been told to, but because they're just interested. And obviously, if your curiosity is subject-focused, that's brilliant. But for many of our students, the curiosity is a bit more wide-ranging than that. They're just people who are interested in things uh, and make an effort to find out. They also have the capacity to think independently, um, make their own decisions and good decisions, and to learn independently, not reliant upon us to say, you need to do this and this and then this and then this and then this. And that's the answer that you're after. No, no. no. Here's the question. Here are some suggestions about what you might do. I think you'll find that a useful place to start. Go on, off you go. Um, if you get stuck, send me an email, give me a ring. We'll talk about it again. I'll see you in a week. Okay? That's what we want. People who get themselves up, go off and do it. We're not going to be there with a cattle prod you know, getting you up in the mornings. Um, if it becomes really serious, we might send the porters to get you up in the morning. Um, but we're not going to be there with a cattle prod routinely. You've got to motivate yourself. Um, hard work. The average Cambridge student works actually 40, 46 hours a week. We know this from a WITCH survey, excellent WITCH survey of universities that was conducted uh, last year. Um, a big disparity, actually, between how hard you have to work here and in Oxford, uh, where they work very slightly less hard than Cambridge students, but very hard. Um, and most other Russell Group universities, the gap, weekly gap, is about 18 hours. So you could go to another really good university, research-intensive university in the UK, get a very good degree on about 27, 28 hours a week work. Here, 45, 46. Are you up for the cup? And if you're not, if you look at that and you think, mm, that looks a bit much to me, do not apply. Okay? You will hate it if you get in. So and we, 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 you know, we speak from experience. Remember that this is 45 hours of work, including lectures, writing your essays, completing your worksheets. 45 hours of work, work ideally in something that you're really interested in, that you love. So it shouldn't be a hardship. It should be something that you just enjoy. Some people will, will you know, work harder than that um, routinely. 
you know, they, they, they like to. But this would be, a, you know, this is the average, and uh, this is what you should expect to do. So it is tough here, but there are eight hours in, uh, sorry, there are 24 hours in every day. Um, that equates to working eight hours, a eight hours a day, six days a week. That means that you've also got eight hours to sleep in and eight hours to do other stuff in. You can have a normal student life. In fact, you'll have even more time to do other stuff in because you won't be spending eight hours of sleep, um, not as an undergraduate. Five, six, you know, will be telling you you need more sleep, but you won't be listening. Um, so, because there'll be other stuff going on. Um, as well as being good in exams, you need to be somebody who's good at the technical side of your subject. Um, if we think about the feedback that we get after interviews, so much of the time it's about whether people could or couldn't do basic manipulations um, in, in the sciences, for example, in mathematics, in economics, in languages. Again and again and again we'll hear, um, yeah, they seem very interested, but they made a lot of mistakes. No, there, were, there were lots of grammatical errors. Okay, we're looking for people who get stuff right. Again, it, it might sound boring and uncreative, but you've got to be able to do these things in order to be able to do the creative and interesting things as well. If you're from outside the UK, or indeed if you're from within the UK, we need good spoken and written English. Um, much more important in sub subjects than others, the international language of mathematics um, is different from um, doing an English literature degree, um, but you still need to be able to follow lectures at pace and communicate with fellow students and, of course, the people who are teaching with you. So if you're an overseas student, that is something that we're likely to specify. And finally, for some of our subjects, but only some, we need to see a vocational commitment, and it's the obvious ones. Medicine, vet, architecture, um, to a lesser degree, engineering and law, but particularly medicine and vet. These, and architecture, these have an obvious career attached to them, and we do need to see in our prospective students an appropriate focus. For other subjects, doesn't matter. Um, your career will sort itself out if you get a really good degree. You know, and, and that's a matter for you. We'll advise you if you want our advice. Um, and of course, we'll provide you with very good advice through the careers service. But in the end, you don't know yet what you're going to end up doing, I mean, unless you're very unusual. And even if you think you know, you might be wrong. Lots of people are at age 17, and indeed at age 37. OK, so the key information that we look at when we admit that's what we offer. That's what we're looking for in terms of personality type, uh, behavior, academic ability. This is the basis on which we choose. So we have here the obvious starting point. I said to you that it's really important that you're good at exams. And the central plank of any decision that we make will be results in public examinations. That's the most important thing by quite a long chalk. Um, and we'll show you in a moment. Most people apply with A-levels, but of course we have lots of people applying with IB and with other international qualifications. We're very well used to dealing with those, and we have very good mechanisms for comparing them with one another. We know what we're doing. Uh, so all qualification systems, broadly speaking, will work for us. Um, we do, for A-level students, place a focus here in Cambridge upon how well you've done in your units, your unit scores, your UMS, which is very unusual. Some other universities look at those now. The University of Bath, for example, is one. But only Cambridge does it systematically. And central to decision-making for all of the UK A-level students, or indeed the international A-level students, is going to be your UMS, the marks that you've got in the tank at the point at which you apply. We will underpin that with a close examination of your reference. Teachers write really good references. We find them really helpful. Uh, the more specific they are, the more helpful we find them, but we find them very useful in the vast majority of cases. And they tend to underpin what we see in the track record. Um, sometimes you will see a really outstanding track record with a reference which hints that this is a very, very able person, but perhaps they don't have the independent learning ability that would like, one would like to see at the very highest level. That can be helpful. Um, sometimes we see a, a slightly more marginal track record from somebody who seems to have intrinsic ability, and the reference suggests um, in subtle ways that perhaps this person doesn't work as hard as they might. Um, very occasionally, you'll get something really exciting in a reference. You don't see this very often now because of the um, fear on the part of all parties of being sued. Um, a highly ambitious student determined to apply to Cambridge can be read in a variety of ways. Um, and uh, we will take that hint. And I quote, but you know, it's a real reference. 
Um, I did once see a reference which described an applicant as a rebel without a clue, um, but you don't hear that sort of thing very often now. And he was indeed a rebel without a clue. Um, you'll make a personal statement. I'm going to give you a little bit of advice on that in a moment. It feeds into interview, actually, here in Cambridge, much more than it does in the admissions process in other universities. And all of that is underpinned by data about your school. Uh, and if you come from the UK, your background in terms of where you live, school performance, uh, the likelihood of people from your local area to go on to university, these sorts of things that help us understand your application better, that contextualize it. But in the end, there is no substitute or very little substitute for very strong academic performance. But the contextual information does allow us to see your application holistically. In art side subjects, we'll ask you to send in some samples of written work, and that can be a factor in decision making too. And finally, we've got interviews. Now, you might think, I get through all of these things, then I get to interview, and interview swings it, but that's not the way it works. What happens in the vast majority of cases is that interview serves to confirm an impression that we've already formed on the basis of all of the other information that we've got. So interview only makes a difference, we estimate, in about 20% of cases. Most interviews are fine. Not that many of them are great. I'm going to talk to you about interviews a little bit later, but if you think that getting into Cambridge is all about doing well at interview, you're mistaken. It's not. It's really all about doing well in exams. Um, interviews can be a factor. And at this college, and in some other colleges too, um, particularly in some subjects, in philosophy, in modern languages, in law, an informal test sat on the day of the interviews is a relatively common phenomenon. Much more common in uh, the sciences than the arts, and those subjects that I've mentioned, philosophy, languages and law are the ones where you should expect in any college to have an informal test alongside your interviews. So, this shows you how important results are. We like data here in Churchill College, so we're going to give you some data now for a little bit. Um, these are applicants to Cambridge University who sat A-level, applicants for geography in the last admissions round. So you can see that we've divided them into four silos or buckets. Um, people whose uh, UMS, their unit scores, across their three best subjects at point of application were less than 85% of the average, then a group with an average of 85 to 90, a group with an average of 90 to 95, and finally a group who averaged more than 95%. And if you look at the final, you can see the numbers of applicants. So you can see that most people applying have averages in the lower 90s, you know, very, very good performance. There are some people with averages uh, in the 80s, quite a few. Uh, the upper 80s, not so many with averages below 85, and actually not that many with averages above 85, uh, above 95, sorry. But if you look at the success rate uh, here, you can see the, the relationship between these scores and likelihood of getting in. If you've got an average of 95% applying for geography or better, you've got an 85% chance of getting in. You might think, gosh, it's tough to get into Cambridge. If you manage to produce that, you've got a really, really good chance. It's a, it's a, you know, if you can find a bookmaker who will accept a wager, you should go and put a really significant amount of money on. You won't find one, um, but, um, but it would be good if you could. And actually, the people with averages 90 and above not quite such a stunning success rate, but still better than evens. You know, still a good chance. Um, a chance below 90%, um, particularly in the upper reaches of the 80s, but it's a bit, it's a bit lower. You might still get in, but it's, it's starting to look like a long shot. So you can see here quite the difference. Now I'm going to show you some more complex data for natural sciences. This series of graphs represents applicants to Churchill for natural sciences two years ago. And we chose natural sciences and we chose Churchill um, because natural sciences is Cambridge's biggest subject uh, in terms of applications and entry. And Churchill in this year had the largest number of natural science applicants in the university. So it's a big data set. Each of these black dots represents an individual. And the axes here show you the interrelationship, the intersection between how the individuals had done in terms of A-stars at GCSE and how they'd done in the 
UMS. And because this, this is science, we're looking at science UMS. We do it slightly differently in arts and sciences. Arts, it's your best three subjects. Sciences, it's your best science subjects, your best three science subjects. So to illustrate the point, here's somebody here who had three A stars at GCSE at points of application and an average of 95%. These are the people we didn't call for interview. So you can see here that we essentially called for interview the top two-thirds of the field, top 70% of the field, roughly. Um, and most of the people who didn't get called for interview had um, performance at A level that put them in the, in the 80s. Some of these people have got slightly higher performance, but um, in these cases, um, we'll have found that there was a significant weakness in a critical subject. So maybe their overall average was, was good, but they're applying for, say, biology, and they had much, much weaker chemistry performance. Or they weren't predicted to get um, the standard offer in the end by their school. You can also see that there were some people we called for interview with much lower scores. And that's holistic assessment for you, um, where there was context around their performance that made us think, yeah, this person could have real potential, even though they haven't got the results yet. So those are the people we called, and you can see there, I think, a little bit more clearly that actually um, there were people whose performance wasn't marvellous on paper by the Cambridge, standards of Cambridge, who we saw anyway. These are people who didn't quite make it in after we'd interviewed them, but who we thought were really good and who we placed in the pool uh, for other colleges to consider. The pool is the second phase of the Cambridge admissions process where the colleges all look at one another's applicants and essentially... Uh, seek to bring in the best group of students from across the whole university. And even though we have very large numbers of applicants here in Churchill, and particularly in the sciences, we still always go to the pool and pull students out from other colleges. Now, that data is not shown on this graph, in fact, but we always do that, and we did that this year. These are the people we made available to other colleges. And you can see here that among the people we thought, well, we're not sure about taking them, let's see what other people think, was the person who had the very, very best record of all in the field. So even though he looked fantastic on paper, there were some concerns at interview, and uh, we thought, well, we're not sure. Um, let, let's, let's just see what other people think. And uh, what happened in the pool, I'm sure, is that they, people saw his application arrive. Uh, they already knew about him, because we can all see one another's applicants on paper in advance. And they were all elbowing one another out of the way to get to him, and saying those idiots at Churchill, they've missed one here. Um, and, uh, of course, he was snapped up straight away. And uh, were they right? Well, I talked to Sally, who's our, our admissions tutor for natural sciences, about this young man uh, a few weeks ago, actually, and said, how is he doing, Sally? Because he's at another college now. She said, he's doing really well. Um, so we missed one. Okay? And other people didn't. But the system worked. He's one of the people who received an offer from other colleges, and those are the people circled in red. The people we made offers to, who applied to us directly, are those. And you can see here, again, it's the... But most of the top group, um, but with two extra individuals, were context, illness, very, very weak performance in school, very strong interviews, meant that we thought, yes, there's real potential here. There's holistic assessment for you. you. Put all of that together, focus on the reds, you can see that most people who get in are in the top reaches of the field. Natural sciences is tough, so those averages are high. You'll have seen lower averages in geography, which is a bit less tough for entry because there are fewer applicants. You'll also see that there are one or two people here who were very, very good, who didn't make it in in the end. Those people were probably a bit unlucky. And I think you have to be philosophical about the process. No matter how careful we are about it, and we're really careful, there are always going to be marginal decisions that are hard to get right. So, you know, if you don't get in having applied, uh, by all means get angry. Don't get too angry. Um, and... Uh, you might decide that you're going to reapply. We can provide advice on that if that seems sensible. Um, you are likelier to take the view that um, it's our loss, and you're likely to be right. You'll go to another excellent university and do really well. And we know that this happens because about four years after each um, uh, admissions round, I get a few letters from people's mums um, <laughs> telling me about how they've uh, done at the University of Exeter, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Edinburgh, Durham. And uh, very occasionally they ask me how um, I can sleep at night. Um, <laughs> but, but fortunately they're not usually um, that bitter. Um, but I understand. I understand. Okay, so personal statements. You have control over this. In most cases your exams are already done. 
You know, you will get the results that you get in August if you're A-level students. You'll have a sense of what your prospects are likely to be. Um, we whip you back to whoops, that slide. That's the one that gives you an indication of, you know, what are my chances likely to be? You know, that's a helpful way of thinking about things. Um, but the personal statement, you may have started writing. You haven't written it yet. For us, it's going to be primarily a starting point for discussion at interview. So that's different from in most other universities where they will make a judgment about your relationship with your subject on the basis of this personal statement. And in some cases, they also make a judgment about the wider contribution that you might make to the university by looking at other things that you do. And we generally say to people, spend about 25% of your personal statement on non-subject related stuff. Here in Cambridge, we, it's not that we don't look at that, we'll have a quick read, but we don't place any emphasis upon it. You, know, you may have done uh, Duke of Edinburgh Gold, uh, you may have grade eight on the cello, these are fantastic things, uh, they will enrich your life, but in the end, neither of them is gonna make you a better mathematician. You know? And it's the academic stuff that we're gonna be focused on. Um, being really good at the cello is obviously a plus if you're applying for music, um, but then it's not an extracurricular thing, it's a super curricular thing. It's something that's actually subject related that's outside your syllabus. And that is something that we would consider actively. Very important that you write with integrity. Why? Well, there's a simple reality here, which you'll all understand straight away, which is that if you tell us you've read things that you haven't read, and we ask you, ask you about them at interview, it's not going to be a very comfortable experience. You know? We won't quite say, well, I'm not going to take that person because he's a liar. Um, but we will take the view that you're somebody who hasn't really delivered on your potential. And we want people who deliver on the potential. So it's very important that you tell the truth in that way. But there's a much more fundamental reason why writing with integrity, being the real you, matters. And that's because you will tell us things that actually help us make a good decision and which will make you stand out from the crowd. So think about ways in which you might make your personal statement stand out. And I'm sure that those of you who've talked about this in school or college already would have been told that it's important that you stand out. You might go on the internet. You might find a really interesting quote, applying for history, say, about the nature of history uh, from, say, I don't know, the, the German philosopher Nietzsche. Um, and uh, you whack that down as part of the opening gambit in your personal statement. You think, yeah, that really gets the nub of, of this subject. And uh, because of the, the, the wonders of Google, uh, you will then find, well, you won't see this, but we will see it, and in fact, we have in the past seen it, that about 40% of the rest of the applicants have also put the same quote in their personal statement. Because that's the way Google works. You know, you will all find the same things. Um, does that tell us really anything about you? No. It tells us that you know how to use Google, which we kind of assume. Um, and uh, it tells us that you're able to identify a striking quote, which is a, a good skill, but in the end, you know, that doesn't really matter that much at university. Um, you might want to tell us that you're really passionate about your subject. You might say, as a young man did a couple of years ago, I'm so committed to history, so passionate about history, so interested in the subject that every day I uncover historical truth. You know, quite a statement, and from a 17-year-old schoolboy, almost certainly wrong. Um, so what did we think in the face of that? Well, we thought, ah, oh, bless. Um, and, and, and were we able to follow it up at interview? You know, it, there's no way that I was going to get that young man in front of me and say to him, as he was sitting there, a little bit nervous, starting to tremble, and say, now then, great to meet you. I see that every day you uncover historical truth. Which historical truths did you uncover on the way here in the back of your dad's car this morning? You know, of course we're not going to do that. So think about another personal statement. Think of one which doesn't bother with any of that. Think of one which says... I've been really interested in history since I, I first studied it as a single subject at school at age 14. And uh, I seemed to have a knack for it. I really enjoyed it. Took it for GCSE, naturally, and uh, did well. Went on and took it for A-level. In my AS year, I did this, this, and this. Of these topics, the two that I really liked were these two. And the reason why I liked them was for this reason, this reason, this reason, and this reason. I particularly liked the work that I read by X on that. Because I really like that work, I went off and I had a look at a couple of his other books, this one and this one. And this is what I thought about them. I thought these things were really interesting and convincing. I wasn't so sure about that. Uh, and the reason I wasn't so sure about it was that I felt that the evidence that he deployed 
was a bit narrow. I wasn't sure that it applied to all of the situation that he was talking about. Is this person interested in history? By golly, they are. You know? They've not told us, they've shown us. You know? Can we talk to them about this at interview? Of course we can. So long as they've read the stuff, which they, they will have done. You know? So you go away and you do it. And that personal statement, even if you all follow the same template, you will write a completely different personal statement from one another. You know? And the other universities looking at a personal statement that don't interview, they'll all say, yeah, this person's, in, this person's really into it. Yeah, this is, we, we've, got a, we've got a real historian here. We've got a, a proper biologist. This person's really interested in their chemistry. Yeah, this person likes maths. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to write with integrity. Talk about, obviously, you're interested in your course, where that came from, the relevant subjects that you've studied at school. You might be somebody applying for engineering. You may have had a bit of engineering work experience. You may have built some stuff, radio-controlled aircraft. Uh, you may have made your bike more efficient. There's you know, all sorts of interesting stuff that you might have done, but you'll probably want to talk a bit about the maths and physics that you enjoy as well, because that's fundamental to engineering as an academic subject and, indeed, as a career. The wider exploration around the curriculum, the supercurricular stuff, the subject-focused, but not in the syllabus stuff, will also make that personal statement much more rich, interesting, and different, and will give us stuff to talk about beyond schoolwork at interview. Reading is the obvious way. It's not the only way, but it's the most important way, certainly in the arts and humanities. Um, other wider exploration via fantastic stuff on TV, on the radio, uh, the Radio 4 program In Our Time, uh, which involves academic, very accessible academic discussion once a week, a group of academics talking about an interesting problem chaired by Melvin Bragg. All of the programs ever broadcast, and there are, there are many hundreds of them, are online in a subject-organized file. So you can go onto that uh, uh, website, the Radio 4 website, go onto In Our Time, and listen to all the maths programs. They're, and some of them are really interesting. One of the best In Our Times I ever heard was on the nature of infinity. Best to me, anyway, and I'm not a mathematician. But I thought it was really interesting, and I could follow it. Um, so that's, that's another way. Great stuff on the internet, of course. Um, reading is probably the, the starting point for most people, but other ways, too. Work experience really only matters where it's relevant, and that's med, medicine primarily, vet, maybe engineering perhaps if you get the opportunity, maybe architecture, um, and medicine, which is the obvious one. We don't need you to have been in with um, brain surgeons uh, and heart surgeons and, you know, and GPs. And all. We, we need you to have done some caring. We need you to understand what it's like to be dealing with people who are sick, disabled, elderly, and their families, you know, how hard it can be. And we like to see a sustained commitment through volunteering. Other subjects, don't really matter. People often come up to me and say, what work experience do I need for history? And I say, no, just read some books. That's all you need. You know, go away and do some reading. Yeah, you might do some work experience with English heritage. You'll learn how to operate the till um, and uh, point people in the direction of the toilets. Um, that could be very interesting, but probably not. History book will do it better. So uh, we use... In contrast to Oxford, big difference between Cambridge and Oxford in admissions terms, Cambridge, focus on exam results, Oxford tests that you do in school or college in early November. Um, we really only use them in Cambridge as an adjunct to interviews, and the only subject where they are fundamental is medicine and vet, medical vet sciences, where the BMAT, the biomedical admissions test, will be one of the factors that helps us decide who to call for interview. You do that in school in early November. I always like to say that it's sat on bonfire night, the 5th of November. Um, it's not always bonfire night, um, but it quite often is. So I, I should add, it might not be bonfire night this year. Don't turn up to school expecting to sit it on bonfire night. Check first. Um, for the BMAT, it's very helpful to revise your science contact, especially GCSE, but actually the early reaches of A-level 2, because some of it is content-focused. Um, and it's very important that you go on the BMAT website, if you're a medical vet, and do some practice. The question's not that tough, but the pace is challenging. So practice working at pace. If we ask you to send in written work, send in stuff that you liked writing, that you'd be happy to talk about. And in most cases, it will tend to be better work if it's recent. It might not be the, the work on which you've got the very best mark. More important that you're interested in talking about it. So interviews, a little bit on interviews. Um, 
you've got through all of that stuff, you're one of the 80% of Cambridge applicants who we call for interview, uh, you're good. Um, you're somebody who is actively in contention for a place. Many of you won't be successful, but of course some of you will be. And uh, the rank order is already there. Interviews might lead to a little bit of movement in the rank order. They're unlikely to make fundamental differences to more than a handful of people. Understanding interviews can help. So typically, the average in Cambridge would be two interviews of 25 minutes roughly duration, uh, typically two lecturers in the subject that you're applying for, and you, um, and uh, they will talk to you about your subject. That's pretty much it. Think of interviews as interactive aptitude tests. So it's not about you, the person. Uh, you might think that it's really important that you come in, that you're confident, that you look us in the eye, that you shake us by the hand. Um, some of my colleagues are incapable of dealing with those things. So that's, that's not a factor that, that you, know, you should worry about. Um, in the end, do we want confident people or do we want people who are really good at their subject? We want people who are really good at their subject. And confidence can be a quiet thing. So remember that it's really all about what you can do. We will test through a series of problem-solving scenarios, and typically you might have four or five sets of questions of accelerating difficulty around a particular theme in a 25-minute interview. Um, as we go through the problem, we will get a sense of how interested you are in the subject, a sense of your aptitude for it, and we will see whether you've got core knowledge. Do you have the stuff in your toolbox to enable you to be able to fix the problem? And in this process, We'll need to help you. We'll discuss with you as you go. Uh, we may stop you or start you or suggest a different direction. We may affirm. We may deny. It depends. And it's hard for you to read, I think, what's going on. And you shouldn't try to read what's going on. But if it seems a bit odd, you know, it isn't. There's no hidden agenda. There are no trick questions. If we say, ah, oh, now you've been taught in school that this is true, this particular thing, we want you to have a think now about how it might not be we're not trying to catch you out. You genuinely have been taught something that's wrong. Okay? Because quite a lot of what you learn at school is wrong. It has to be because you're at a relatively early stage still in your educational development, and some stuff has to be made more simple so that it can be taught to students. You know, at university, it's going to be a bit more complex. Or it might not be wrong what you've been taught, but there's an alternative explanation. Let's think about the alternative explanation. Um, so there's nothing going on that you can't see. And the way to handle this is the way to write your personal statement. You be yourself. You get a question you don't understand, you say, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, we're not going to mark you down for that. We might, and this is highly likely, think, ah, no, I didn't ask it very well. I'll try again. Okay? We might say to you, oh, sorry, I garbled that. <laughs> think about it this way. You might say, I, I haven't covered that. We might say, oh, have you not done that bit of the syllabus? Yes. Oh, fine. Okay, well, forget that question. Let's have a look at this one instead. Again, no one's going to mark you down for that. Um, if you need a bit of time to think, you say so. Now, I just need to think about that for a moment. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I've been in interviews before where people have sat in silence for one minute you know, while they're thinking about something, and then they come up with a really good answer. You know, I've sat in interviews where they're silent for one minute and then they come up with completely the wrong answer. But that's fine too, you know, so long as there are other right answers. You know, we're not gonna, we don't mark interviews negatively. So just be yourself. Assume that we're being ourselves, which we genuinely are, and you be yourselves too. What do we talk about? We talk about your academic work. Uh, that's the number one. In the Arts and Humanities, we will talk to you about other stuff that you've read and done at some point in the interview, or likelihood, in all likelihood. Uh, we will get a sense of how interested you are in the subject by how much you know about it outside the taught curriculum. You know, is this something that you're genuinely interested in? Every year I will interview 50% of the economics uh, field here at church. It's the same in other colleges. Very good students, very good on paper. Um, there is no evidence at all in the interview that they really have any understanding of economics outside what they've been taught or that they've done any real reading beyond the curriculum. They're applying for economics because they think that this is a way to get a job that earns lots of money. Um, they won't say that if you ask them. They'll tell you that they want to help other people. Um, uh, and they want to help themselves to a Ferrari, um, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. 
Um, and actually, in the real economic world, that's all, you know, that's all fine. You know, that, that, that's the way that the world works, economically, in lots of ways. Um, but what we want is people who are maybe honest about those things, but also, more importantly, um, are just interested in the subject as an intellectual discipline. And of course, some of the economists do want to help other people. They're interested in developmental economics. But if they're in that category, then they've really thought about this stuff and they've read about it. You know, we know we get a real sense of them. Um, but in many subjects, that subject related wider awareness is, is, is less important. It's, it's more important in the social sciences, broadly speaking, the arts and humanities and the sciences. Yeah, you'd want a little bit of it, but it's not critical. Um, if somebody uh, doesn't know what's going on um, in the Large Hadron Collider, uh, applying for natural sciences, that's not a deal breaker. They might just not be interested in that bit of science. You know, they're really good at the science that they've done, really, really adept and quick. You know, that, that will be good. Good reference, everything else stacking up nicely. And prompt material, this is common. This is stuff that you've not seen before. It gets you on a level playing field. It could be uh, a passage of historical writing or an historical document in my subject. It could be, it's likely to be a poem in English, uh, a picture in history of art, buildings in architecture. It could be a piece of scientific equipment in natural sciences or in engineering, but something that can form the basis of discussion. And in every case, whether it's schoolwork or whatever it is, will get you to approach your knowledge in new ways, uh, think about things, step back, try and see the big picture, the patterns, maybe be a bit more forensic and precise, work your way through some technical stuff uh, that is important for your course. 